last time, just to review a little bit, the lamb standing on Mount Zion, chapter 14, uh, began with those words, and the 144,000. So it was a flash forward. We're still in sort of a flash forward section of Revelation that takes us forward to the return of Christ and kind of gets us glimpsing forward, even though we have not gone through the seven bowls of God's wrath yet, the seven vials. We have not finished all our study of the judgments. That'll be chapter 16, the last plagues. So we still have a ways to go with the judgments of God, but it kind of flashes us forward. And we also haven't talked about Babylon, which will be an extended discussion as we move into chapter 17 and 18, but we'll get a glimpse of that tonight as well. And that's a very important topic. So that's kind of where we've been and where we're going. Uh, so, but here we have a separate vision. I think it kind of stands along with the vision of the three angels that describe things to come, a forecast of what will happen at the close of the tribulation period as Jesus returns. Um, and we'll see, I think we can take this text quite literally. Let's see what you think. Lord, we pray, teach us from your word. You are the teacher here. And we thank you, Lord. We can sit at your feet. We just think of the disciples as they sat at your feet and you taught them, as they gathered around. Think of that Sermon on the Mount when people just gathered there to hear you teach. And we believe you had a sense of humor sometimes as you taught about those things. And other times you were so serious and so moving in what you said. And we just pray you would be our teacher tonight. So move us with the word of God. May we be blessed to study it together. May we see application that we hadn't seen before. May we see the truth that may have been concealed in the past. May it be revealed now in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is verse 6. John writes, in his vision, it says, here. I mean, we, we assume, and John is still receiving these incredible visions, long, long visions. Then I saw another angel, and he's seen so many angels already. Another angel flying in midair, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. He said in a loud voice, fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. God sees it as having been accomplished. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Verse 8, a second angel followed and said, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. This is a preview really here which made all the nations dr drink the maddening wine of her adulteries, of her fornication. In verse 9, a third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and his image and receives the mark on the forehead or on the hand, he too will drink of the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. He will be tormented with burning sulfur, brimstone, in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment rises. Notice the tense there. Implied that will rise forever and ever. There is no rest day or night for those who worship the beast in his image or for anyone who receives the mark of his name. This calls for patient endurance on the part of the saints who obey God's commandments and remain faithful to Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven say, Right. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labor, for their deeds will follow them. Amen. And then the next section, next time, we'll look at the harvest, the sickle, the angels involved in that. And that's the passage that leads, at the end of the chapter, to the blood rising as high as the horse's bridles. And uh, that's a little grisly, that last verse of the chapter. We'll look at that next time. So let's just go down to that. We just outlined in terms of the angels. The first angel proclaims the everlasting gospel, it says. And let's look at verse 6. Another angel, and all these angels appearing to, I don't think we have to really try to identify. Another angel flying in midair in the NIV, but literally in mid heaven, maybe in the second heaven, you know, and the atmosphere would be the first heaven, so maybe up above that. He had the eternal or everlasting gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. To my knowledge, this is the only place where an angel preaches the gospel because that task has been entrusted to who? You, <laughs> right? You've been entrusted with preaching the gospel. Certainly preachers are. But here it's an angel. Isn't that interesting? Uh, and many understand this. I, I, I'm going to go with that view myself that this is, this is literally... 
he, this angel does preach the gospel uh, to the citizens of the world in large part as a testimony against them because so many have followed the Antichrist, have followed the beast, and they are doomed. We see that in this text. They're doomed to hell. But that they, they'd be without excuse, right? So this angel literally flying above the earth, and you know, it's, do the people of the earth hear it? I mean, it seems like they would. I mean, if, if God sends an angel to preach the gospel, it must be so that people could hear it, right? Which is an amazing miracle. God sending a holy angel to bear witness to the fact that God sent his son to die on the cross for their sins and was raised from the dead to prove his power to defeat sin. This is the gospel, the death, burial, resurrection of Christ, and that this angel would be preaching this. That's one view, and I like that view. The other view, and by the way, this would be the ultimate fulfillment of something Jesus prophesied. Can you figure that out? And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness, Matthew 24, 14, unto all the nations, and then shall the end come. So that the angel making sure at the end of the age maybe making up for the lack of the church, <laughs> getting the gospel out for the, just for those that are alive at that time. So if, if this truly is an angel truly preaching the gospel, it's the complete conclusion. Again, normally that's the job of the church. The other view would be that it's not really the gospel, and that verse 7 is the content of the message. If you look at verse 6 and verse 7, that verse 7 is the so-called quote-unquote gospel that the angel is preaching. Fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. We wouldn't think of that as the gospel, but it's, and gospel means good news, of course. So it's sort of a final call to worship the one true God with that view. And so it's good news in that sense that maybe there's a last chance to worship the one and true God. Maybe you could combine those two views. I kind of like that idea where he truly is preaching the gospel death, burial, resurrection of Christ, but his sermon concludes, the angel's sermon concludes with what we have in verse 7. Does that make sense? Be because of the truth of the gospel, fear God and give him glory. Come to him now before it's too late. The hour of his judgment has come. You stand on the brink of, of terrible judgment. Worship him now. now. If anybody was on the fence, if anybody could hide from the Antichrist and did not receive the mark, maybe they could still come. And by the way, notice verse 7b. God is the creator, right? Proclaimed from Genesis to Revelation throughout the scriptures. You know, I heard a preacher on the radio this morning driving to church, and it sounded to me like he was supporting, you know, the long day-age theory, like the earth is millions of years old, and, you know, it kind of evolved, everything evolved, but God was still involved. I don't like that view. I mean, I'm a young earth guy. I believe the earth's about 6,000 years old, you know, it's literally as the Bible proclaims it. And he made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water, and maybe in many cases maybe made them with the appearance of age. But uh, in any case, he is the creator here, right? So this is a message, look at verse 7, that we should include in our gospel witness. Fear God. Amen. Give him the glory because of what he has done. Look what he has done in Christ. We were talking to somebody this week, and she said, this is the greatest story ever told, right? This is the most wonderful story good news. Therefore, fear God and give him the glory because a judgment day is coming, verse 7. And worship him, right? Because he is the creator God. And don't buy into this stuff that everything just evolved over millions of years. You know, evolution stands as our great enemy of the Christian faith, I think. And really, the enemy of all religion in a way, in the world. Because ultimately, evolution wipes out all faith in God, right? Because there is no God. Everything just evolved. So, amen. Hear this message tonight. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. What did Jesus say to the woman at the well? Remember, yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers, right? The true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. They're the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit. His worshipers must worship in spirit and truth. And what's always struck me, verse 24, where he says they must it's not worship if we don't worship in spirit and in truth. It's just ritual, isn't it? It's just religion. If, if the Holy Spirit is not part of our worship, you know, we might as well just be worshiping a rock because there's nothing in it. So, but anyway, so that's the first angel proclaiming the everlasting gospel. Because the word gospel is used, I like the view 
that it is the good news of the salvation through Christ, but it does involve, of course, worshiping and fearing God. Now, the second angel announces the fall of Babylon, and I don't want to get into this too deep because we'll be getting into it when we attack chapter 18, verse 8. The second angel followed and said, fallen, as if it, remember, God sees everything is outside of time. I mean, you can see that it's happened, even though it hasn't happened, right? Because Babylon has yet to fall, because it won't fall till Christ returns, chapter 19. But fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, which made all the nations, all the Gentiles, all the ethnic groups, the people, the heathen, drink the maddening wine of her fornications, of her adulteries. So this is an important verse to try to begin to understand who, who, what is this Babylon the Great? Somehow Babylon the Great has made all the peoples of all the nations drink this intoxicating view of things. And the fornications there may, re, may refer to literal sexual sin or maybe to other apostate behavior and other behavior that's ungodly as well. And we'll have an extended discussion soon in that, but... I would summarize, if you look at chapter 18 for just a couple of verses, just to get a preview of it, and this would be, without looking at many of the verses, but Babylon, in my understanding, is a worldwide confederacy in the end times, led by the Antichrist, a confederacy of kings and, their, and nations. This is Babylon in the end times. So it isn't just one nation, in my understanding. Look at 18, verse 3. All the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. So Babylon is involved throughout the world in the Antichrist kingdom. If you look at uh, 18 verse 9, when the kings of the earth who committed adultery with her and shared her luxury see the smoke of her burning, they will weep and mourn over her. So it's the worldview of the end times. It's the teaching of the Antichrist. It's the teaching of the devil is closely connected with this Babylon the great but it's a system of trade and merchandising as well. Look at chapter 18 again, verse 3. Um, the kings of the earth committed adultery, 3b, with her, and the merchants of the earth grew rich from her excessive luxuries. So it has to do with wealth and trade and merchandising. This fits our modern world, our internet world today, our shopping online world today, and Babylon is somehow boiling up within that, I think. So it's a worldwide confederacy of kings and nations. It's a system of trade and merchandising. Look at verse 11. The merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her because no one buys their cargoes anymore. It has to do with money and wealth and power. This is Babylon the Great. And it's also, though, a city. And this is what's confusing. If you look at chapter 18, verse 10, right? Terrified or torment, they will cry far off, stand far off and cry, woe. Woe, O oh great city, O oh Babylon, city of power. In one hour, your doom has come. So this whole system is centered in one city. What city is it? Is it New York? Is it Rome? Is it literal Babylon? I checked it out this week, and literal Babylon is still there. There's still a lot of ruins there. Saddam Hussein tried to make it a tourist attraction and tried to rebuild things which now the archaeologists are trying to remove because he put that over the old stones, you know. Um, and, they, you know, probably nobody, not many people go there as a tourist attraction because, you know, <laughs> I mean, where it's located, right? You don't want to go to Iraq in the middle of Iraq somewhere. Uh, so, but it's still there, and it could be rebuilt. And, in fact, there is some rebuilding going on in and around it because of the archaeology studies and the tourist traffic that they have. It could be literal but it could be some other city uh, that would be a shipping center. If you look at uh, chapter 18, verse 16, or 15, the merchants who sold these things and gained their wealth from her will stand far off, terrified or torment. They will weep and mourn, oh, cry out, oh, great, great city, whoa, dressed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, and so forth. And also verse t uh, 19. I'm still in chapter 18, verse 19. Woe, woe, O great city, where all who had ships on the sea became rich through her wealth. And that might mean it's not Babylon. It's something more like New York City. Even Rome does not have a seaport in itself. Uh, New York does. <laughs> or other cities around the world. You know, the Netherlands is a major center of shipping, actually. Uh, so who knows, right? That, that's tough. We'll get to that a little later. But that's a little preview. We'll go back to our chapter here, chapter 14. 
Um, where did Babylon, I just tipped it off. Where did Babel begin, right? We have Babylon, which comes from Babel, the confusion of tongues way back in Genesis 11. So this is something that's been happening almost from the dawn of time, right? Babylon has been growing. Babylon is this man-centered approach to life, right? That man is a measure of all things. You see it in communism, maybe socialism. You see it in a lot of isms, actually, uh, and certainly in materialism. Man is a measure. We can go back to Genesis 11. Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens. Let us. Can you climb to the heavens? Can you climb to God? That's what they wanted to do, right? So that we may make a name for ourselves, Genesis 11, 4 and not be scattered over the face of the whole earth. And guess what? God scattered them, right? God, there wasn't a time for Babylon to, to come to completion, but in Revelation, we see that time has come where God is letting the Antichrist bring this world together under one government. But early in Genesis 11, that was way before its time, so God had to confuse the tongues and scatter them, uh, you know, paving the way for what we have in the end times we're studying today. Um, also, the nation of Babylon, if you read your Old Testament, Testament, you know that that's a major part of Old Testament history, isn't it? You have the Assyrians, and then just after them, the Babylonians come in to conquer the Jews, right? And conquer many, many nations. They just rolled over nations, and then later it would be the Greeks and the Romans and so forth. But Babylon was a major kingdom. It was a city, and it was a major kingdom. It was Babylon and Babylonia, right? So that's a type. We, what, we, like we study our Old Testament, we, maybe we're going to see in those passages of the Old Testament what Babylon will be like in the end times, right? Remember good old Nebuchadnezzar? <laughs> God humbled him, didn't he? What did he do with Nebuchadnezzar, remember? Made me grass like a cow. <laughs> God can humble people, can't he? Amen. So uh, the Antichrist, of course, will bring this all together in this ungodly system, ungodly philosophy, worldview, but city as well, and trading system. And I think it's just everything wrapped up into one, you know. And so we'll have to leave it there. We'll study it when we get to that chapter. The third angel, chapter 14, verse 9, 9, 10, 11, who prophesies the doom of the worshipers of the beast. So let's look at Revelation 14, 9. The third angel followed them, followed the other two angels, and said in a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on the forehead or on the hand, he too will drink of the wine of God's wrath. Now, we've already talked about the mark of the beast. So, we, you know, that was in chapter 13, uh, verses like verse 16, 17, 18. We had talked about the mark of the beast. You couldn't buy or sell unless you had the mark, and this will be what the Antichrist will use to be sure people fall into line because everybody needs food and groceries and clothes and gas for their car, and you won't be able to buy and sell without the mark. But here we read, if anyone worships the beast and receives his mark, <laughs> he's going to drink of the wine. So this, does this make them irredeemable? It seems like it does. You know, you know, and I wonder too, verse 9, verse 10, if this is in God's word, not so much for us. I know all God's word is for us. But if this is here so that during the tribulation they can read this, those who are searching during the tribulation period, and they're hearing that people are receiving this mark, but they find a Bible, they find a New Testament, they can read this verse and say, no, I'm not going to receive the mark. Look what it says here. I will drink of the wine, the fury of God's wrath, if I receive that mark, and God's got it right here in the book for them. But it's interesting for us to study as well. Remember, the Antichrist will be a savior. He'll be everybody's savior, right? And I, th I really believe the Antichrist is going to promise free everything. He's going to promise it. He probably won't come through. He's going to promise free breakfast, free lunch, free dinner, free college, free housing, free health care. He's going to provide it all. And everybody's just going to fall into it and love it, you know, and it really fits modern progressive mentality, right? The government is the savior with that mentality, which goes quite against our founders, doesn't it? <laughs> but this will not be a good thing. As the worshiper of the beast, he too will drink of the wine. Wine, wine that makes you stagger, right? Wine that makes you drunk. But this is a wine of God's wrath. It makes you stagger and fall and fall right down into hell. Poured full strength. It's a wonderful metaphor illustration 
into the cup of his wrath. So the wrath of God. And if, if you really want to study out how, how relevant this is to today, let's take a quick look at Romans 1. We got time just quick on Romans 1. And I read this part of my Bible reading this week. And I said, Romans 1 was written for our day. <laughs> I know it was written for Paul's day. Paul wrote it, you know, for what was happening then. But boy, he wrote it for America 2018. Romans 1. Now, we can't look at the whole chapter here, but particularly more the end of the last part, verse 18, Romans 1, 18, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness. Way back in Paul's time, he writes this, right? How much more so today? And the wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness, since what may be known about God is plain to them. It seems to say that people have an innate belief in God, but they're suppressing it. They're hiding from it. The people that strongly defend their views. Why are they so strong in defense of them? Because of guilt, I think, right? The, his, all these things plainly seen, verse 20, his eternal power is divine nature, but verse 21, although they knew God, they neither glorified nor gave thanks to him. They claimed to be wise, verse 22, they became fools. This is our society today, exchanging the glory of God for images, and it's idolatry, and God... I underline this in my Bible, both in verse 24 and verse 28, God gave them over. And those are fearsome words, aren't they? God gave them over to the sinful desires of their hearts, to sexual impurity. And Paul pulls that out as a major sin, and that is our nation today, isn't it? He gave them over. Right, shameful us, verse 26. Even their women, like Paul sustained back, I can't believe even the women. It's bad enough the men do this stuff, right? And he talks about the men in verse 27 as well. And then again, verse 28, he gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done and so forth. So that really ties in with what we're studying here, I think, when we see the wrath of the Lamb, we see the wine of the fury of God's wrath. It's been boiling for a long time in the history of the world, going all the way back to Bible times, pre-Bible times, all the way back to the days of Noah, you know, the sin of man, and he did judge it in Noah's day, but then it comes back, and God is upset, the wrath of God, an attribute of God, by the way, the wrath of God, a very attribute of God. He's a God of love, he's a God of wrath, and those two things coexist as, as qualities or identities of God himself. Let's go back to chapter 14. Um, <laughs> and if you look at Verse 10b, let's see, let's get over there, 10b, uh, he will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the lamb. I want you to think about that verse. The one who worships the beast will be tormented with brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb. So let me ask you a question. Is hell separation from God? Is hell eternal separation from God? No. Not at all. Is it? Remember, God is omnipresent anyway, right? God is omnipresent. He's present everywhere. So he's present in hell just as he's present in heaven. So you have that basic theological truth. So hell is not separation from God, even just in a general way. But here's a verse that says the holy angels of the Lamb will be present there to bear witness to their suffering. Their torment could also be translated torture. With burning sulfur, their torment is good though, in hell. And I was wondering about it. Why the lamb? Why would particularly the lamb be mentioned? It doesn't say God. It says the lamb. Isn't it right that Jesus would be there in hell? Because he is the judge of all men, right? All judgment has been committed to the son. Therefore, he's the ultimate jailer of those in hell. In hell. He is the one who has prosecuted them, who has borne witness to their sin. He is the one who died for their sin. He is the one who has judged them for not receiving him as their savior. And so he bears witness. He's in the, and the holy angels, why are they there? <laughs> well, I, I think, you know, they're there as witnesses. They're there as, as guards. As, they're there as reminders of the holiness of God, reminders of a God who had this holy plan for their lives and they rejected it. And throughout eternity, they'll see these angels, these holy angels, perfect creatures that God
God made. And they're there, like jailers, like guards. And it's a witness to them. It's part of their torment to see this wonderful. And they could have had that white robe themselves, right? They couldn't have been an angel, but they could have had a white robe in glory. But they rejected the Savior. They rejected the Son. So that's a fascinating verse. <laughs> and the smoke, verse 11, of their torment rises forever and ever. There are some today that try to teach annihilation, that ultimately those in hell will be annihilated, and that's the end of hell, and it's all wrapped up in the end of time because God will bring all things together and that, you know, they'll do away with hell. It says forever and ever, right? <laughs> the plain truth, you know, plain sense makes the best sense. You seek no other sense of the word of God, right? Plain sense is, is forever and ever. After all, you know, we believe eternity is forever for us, right? There's no rest day or night from the, from the heat, from the pain, from the torment for those who worship the beast in his image or for anyone who receives the mark of his name. So why is hell eternal? Because life is eternal, right? Life, human life is eternal, saved or no, right? Once we're born into this world, we live eternally, either in glory, well, first on earth, but when we die, right, we're going to either live in hell eternally. Life is eternal. And so hell must be eternal, just as heaven must be eternal. And so the life of the damned will be a life of torment. Remember the parable of the rich man and Lazarus? I did a sermon one time on that text, Seven Facts About Hell, if you study that out. But three of them, hell is a painful place. Remember the rich man, I'm in torment here in this flame. Hell is a hot place. <laughs> Same verse. And hell is a permanent place. You are fixed, right? You couldn't cross over. Nobody's going to bring him cool water to cool his tongue, right? So the third angel prophesying the doom of the worshipers of the beast. And uh, I'll have that come out there. I guess you kind of see it there. And then conclusion, I think we'll just take the last verses for a conclusion. So verse 12 says, this calls for patient endurance on the part of the saints who obey God's commandments and remain faithful to Jesus. It could be a general verse, speaking of us, right? Just reading these terrible things, these terrible words. Uh, we're waiting for Christ to return. We may be living in the last days. It calls for patient endurance. Certainly it calls for patient endurance for 144,000 to save Jews during the tribulation period or those who were sealed, right? The ones who were sealed and protected and maybe some have been sheltered and hid away by God, or some are martyred. This calls for patient endurance. Uh, King James, they that keep the commandments of God in the faith of Jesus. It's a good definition of what it, remains, what it means to be a Christian, right? We keep the commandments of God in the faith of Jesus. We remain faithful. So, and again, fulfillment of Matthew 24, the Olivet Discourse, Jesus said, then there will be great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equaled again. If those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. So this calls for patient endurance on the part of the saints. And what you're going through today may call for patient endurance on the part of the saints, right? Just hang in there. Just one step at a time, one day at a time. Just keep on keeping on. Patient endurance. Remain faithful. Obey God's commands. And then I heard a voice, verse 13, from heaven say, right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. I'm glad you wrote that, John. I'm really glad that you wrote that, and I can read that today. I think of so many we've said goodbye to over the years. Tough being in the ministry in many ways. Because when you're in the ministry, you go to more funerals than anybody else. <laughs> you know, And it's tough. But blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Blessed are they. They are blessed. They're in a so much better place than we are. And, and even going through death here, right? Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. So blessed. It's a blessing. Precious in the sight of the Lord is what? The death of his saints. Psalm 116, verse 15. And that's a verse to cling to. If you lost your mom or dad, you know, like I have. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints, especially because we're talking about a Christian person, right? Remember that, Psalm 116, verse 15. And then, yes, says the Spirit, as we wrap it up, they will rest from their labor, for their deeds or their works will follow them. So what does that mean? 
Their works will follow them. They say you can't take it with you, right? We like to say you can't take it with you, but you can send it on ahead, right? Because Jesus said, lay up treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy, right? Where thieves do not break in and steal. But although here it says their deeds will follow them. So, I mean, I think it's kind of the same thing that God sees our good works. He sees our service for him. And one day we'll be rewarded for that. And that will come later. So in that sense, it follows, right? We will not receive often the reward in this world. Maybe nobody's going to say thank you for your ministry, right? But someday in heaven, thank you for giving to the Lord, right? For I was a life that was changed. Amen. What a great song. So I think maybe that's the sense there. Their deeds will follow them. So again, we'll close with the words of Christ, you know, and I think it's a good application to store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. This is the day to do that, right? Right now is the time to store up some treasure in heaven. You can't take it with you, but you can send it ahead or it will be your rewards that you receive after. Moth and rust do not destroy there. Everything here will be destroyed in that way. Thieves do not break in and steal. Let us lay up treasures and let us be patient, faithful as we wait. You know, this world is not all there is. And one of the reasons I think God gave us revelation so that we can, we can be sure of this. And we know it doesn't end well for earth, but it ends well for Christians. There will be a new heaven and a new earth and a new people of God, the kingdom of God, and that will be us. Lord, help us to occupy to you, come to serve you well. Help us to remain faithful. This calls for patient endurance on the part of the saints. Help us to be patient. Help us to endure. Help us to hang in there for you, Lord. Help us to just, just take it day by day and serve you well as best we can. May we not be discouraged, but rather encouraged tonight from your word, knowing your plan will be fulfilled. Help us to keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus every day, we pray. Give us a witness and a testimony. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that we have some days left where we can serve you. We look forward to that day you call us home. Lord, we know we're going to rest in heavenly glory. What a thought that is. No more hard physical labor, just worship and ministry for you. What a joy that will be. And we pray that you would help us to lay up those treasures in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.